uh, the future. <laughs> yeah, okay, so this is work, yeah, that has been just saying I've been working on uh, very recently. It's uh, even hotter than hot for presses because it actually hasn't been released yet. Uh, uh, hopefully, yeah, be on the lookout for that in the next 10 days or so. Um, but yeah, so a lot of this work is, is somewhat preliminary, but still kind of fun to talk about. Um, so this is my work on using large language models as pr proposal functions in a neurosymbolic expert system. Um, as Ben said, I'm a fourth year PhD. Uh, this is kind of fun because this is my first time actually doing this presentation in person. Um, yeah. So the general goal of my research uh, is to use language models to construct natural language-based interpretable reasoning methods. Uh, so why natural language based? Because in the last decade, we have increasingly powerful language models that are able to consume massive amounts of information of freely available text uh, in order to create uh, 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 incredibly powerful representations on which they can reason and perform an incredible action or some version of it. Um, why else would, uh, uh, natural language? Well, because human, humans will communi uh, communicate and think on the basis of natural language. Possibly, we don't know exactly what's going on in our heads, but we know that people can understand language, can uh, make arguments on the basis of language, and can justify their actions on the basis of language. Um, and why also to use natural language? Because we don't need to commit to a formalism. Uh, there's a lot of debate uh, uh, in various communities about if you were trying to, to reason symbolically, what type of formalism you'd use, some version of first order logic versus something else. Uh, if you use natural language, then you don't need to commit to a particular type of symbolism. Why am I aiming for interpretable? Well, because most of the time, large language models are not interpretable. They're famous, famously uh, black box. They, they are, are continuous representations that we have no idea for the most part what's going on. Uh, and that's why in the last five or six years, uh, the, the notion of explainable artificial intelligence has really become a big thing, or rather re-become a new thing, uh, because explainable artificial intelligence, as I, got in, uh, as I will get into, uh, has been around for, for 50 to 60 years. Uh, why else interpretable? Well, if you have something that is making inter performing interpretable reasoning, then you have a, 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 a lens into the decision process that it, it, it's, it's undergoing. That means that you can potentially control for whether, whether it makes one decision versus another. You can teach it to, to, to make one decision versus another, and you can uh, have a, a better sense of, of, of whether the, the model is making a decision on the, pro on, on the basis of, of proper facts as opposed to, to uh, artificial characteristics. And then why systematic uh, is sort of similar to the, the, the previous point. Uh, systematic, which it means making a, a series of logically coherent decisions uh, in order to, to make a high level decision. Uh, systematic allows you to, to uh, have granular access to, to small level decisions that are more easy to, more easily fixed than, than high level. Okay, so uh, before we get into the actual uh, uh, project, we'll talk a little bit about some of the inspiration from classical reasoning. Uh, so this notion of systematic interpretable uh, uh, artificial reasoning is not a new idea. In fact, it was uh, part of the kind of uh, the original roots of, of, of uh, modern artificial intelligence. Um, starting with these two guys, uh, Newell and Simon, who were two researchers at Carnegie Mellon in the 50s, uh, they came up with this idea uh, of the logic theorist, uh, which was basically just an artificial proof generator. It would uh, uh, it, was, it was able to to construct these these proofs that started from a set of axioms that provided to the system. It would then construct a proof on the basis of logical operations that were interpretable to human. And so this, this model was able, it took uh, 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 this, this uh, uh, set of, 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 this book of proofs and was basically able to, to replicate them. And in fact, it was able to come up with proofs that uh, humans had otherwise not been able to come up with. Uh, and so they made this kind of over grand, grandiose argument about how this, this model is the way of the future because it, it's able to do human-like reasoning uh, about math, <laughs> about simple ma mathematic accidents, uh, but it's able to do that in a in a simple manner, automatic in an automatic fashion. Uh, moving forward two years, we have the second uh, pasty white guy uh, named uh, uh, John McCarthy. Uh, he kind of builds on this notion of of uh, interpretable proof search, uh, but he kind of uh, uh, expands this to a, a, a more general sphere. Uh, he introduces the system called uh, Advice Taker, which is a system that, that also does uh, proof search, but it's doing proof search in a much more general fashion. That is, he points out that first order logic uh, or a variant of first order logic is, is very much uh, defined by the writer, by the, the human that's defining what a symbol should be, what, uh, what the vocabulary of, through which you are searching is. And that vocabulary is sort of completely at, at, at the, the um, uh, under the control of, of, of the writer. And so you can basically uh, do whatever you want with it. It, it could uh, be, 
pertain to math, it could pertain to an arbitrary uh, uh, problem. And so he kind of takes a bunch of toy problem, uh, a, a bunch of toy examples in his, his paper, where he shows that you could, for example, create a, a, a discrete representation of planning to, to leave your desk that you're currently sitting at and go get on an airplane and fly out somewhere. And he shows that you can prove some query, the query, uh, I want to be at an airport. Uh, and you can produce a deductive proof that proves the statement that also allows you to make it a planable decision uh, on the basis of, of the vocabulary that you've defined. And so this is like this really novel idea is it's expanding this notion of, of mathematical theorem proving to, to general problem solving. And so this, this, this idea is, is, is kind of extremely influential and it kind of uh, uh, led to 40 to 50 years of, of uh, research into artificial intelligence, taking this idea that Information and knowledge, as, so long as you've come up with the correct knowledge representation, can be expressed in first order logic. And then, in order to do artificial reasoning, you can just perform theorem proving over it. Um, I've put a quote here that is relatively uncontroversial. It's just showing that a famous artificial intelligence researcher, Jerry Hobbs, uh, uh, was saying this uh, only a couple years ago. Uh, and so, still relevant, has been relevant. Uh, and then, the last uh, bit of, of, of uh, inspiration. Um, Taking this idea from John McCarthy and moving it into the uh, next 30 odd years of, of, of research uh, is the notion of, of the, the expert system, which is basically just rule taker on steroids. So it takes this idea of knowledge, uh, having someone write down a bunch of knowledge about a given problem and then feeding it to this theorem prover and it comes up with solutions, uh, but doing that at a kind of a broader and, and, and uh, potentially industrial scale. And so what this looks like uh, is the little diagram on the right, I have a pointer. Nope, doesn't work. All right. All right, whatever. Um, the idea is that you are designing a theorem proving system that is trying as, as, as effectively as possible to emulate the decisions of, of an expert in a given domain. And so you'd have a, a, a person called a knowledge engineer who would go talk to an expert, say an expert in, in the medical domain or in the, in, uh, in, in, in the humanities or whatever. Um, and they would, would uh, query them for how they would solve a particular problem, say a classification problem. A very uh, famous uh, example of this is this, this uh, system called MISIN, which was developed by uh, Stanford, Stanford researchers in the 1960s uh, that uh, was able to classify blood diseases based off of the details about a, a given patient. And it was, it was able to do that at the level of, of an entry level uh, of medical profession. Um, and the way it did this was the people who knew how to write these 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 uh, logical rules that that you would feed to an inference engine, they would go and talk to a medical expert, a, a, a doctor, um, and ask them how you the the, the heuristics by which they would they would uh, classify a disease, and then they would write down the rules that look like this. Uh, this one, this this rule is, can you see that? Yeah. Uh, so this rule is 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 stated in natural language, but it's actually you know, a programming language called Lisp when it's fed to the machine. Uh, but it's 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 really simple. It's, it's this if then uh, rule called a, a production rule, uh, in which you have a set of, of, of prerequisites called the antecedent uh, that conjunctively would imply a given uh, consequent, uh, the then part of the clause. Um, and so you write a couple hundred of these rules and you feed it to a new, the inference engine and it's, it's incredibly effective at, at performing disease, blood disease classification uh, because it's trying to emulate the knowledge that has been transferred from a domain expert into this artificial system. Um, and so this should all be reviewed for people who took like artificial intelligence with, with Ben or with Philip. Um, but this idea is, is still incredibly powerful, right? You can talk to someone who it, it knows a lot about a given domain. You can infuse that knowledge into a system. Uh, it will reason uh, automatically and quickly, ideally, uh, and it will then make a decision on the basis of an interpretation proof about that domain specific knowledge. So why are expert systems not a thing? Why are we all not working on expert systems anymore? Well, there are two principal problems with, with, with the classical expert system. Uh, the first is that knowledge acquisition sounds really cool in, in theory, but actually not that easy. So if you've ever tried to say, explain to your biologist cousin how GPT-3 works, you know that the transfer of knowledge between uh, specific domains of expertise is incredibly difficult. So if I know a lot about Prolog and I'm trying to learn a lot about uh, blood diseases, uh, there's going to be some amount of loss of information when, I'm, when I translate this expert knowledge into, into the, the field, the reasoning uh, domain. Um, and so the process that knowledge, engineer, of knowledge engineers talking to experts and then trying to encode the information is incredibly laborious. You have to go to them uh, uh, many times, you have to revise your rules, you have to add new rules, new edge cases. Uh, it, 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 there, there's entire uh, fields just on this notion of knowledge acquisition, how to do it uh, most effectively. Um, and, and the general conclusion that is that it takes like 20 to 40 uh, man years to get a good expert system to work in the, in the industrial um, uh, space. 
Uh, and so that's really difficult and really hard. The other big problem with an expert system is that it's incredibly brittle. So I talked about how you can infuse a, a given, uh, the, the language of a given domain into a symbolic representation, but committing to a given symbolic uh, uh, representation means that you, you are potentially uh, uh, removing some amount of information that's expressible in the domain. Um, so say for example, that I'm working in, in, in the mycin domain, working with, with uh, trying to parse the, the information about a given patient in order to make a decision about what blood disease they have. Um, a lot of the rules that are in my knowledge base will look like something like this. This is called a lexical relation. It basically says, if I see the, the spam uh, uh, oxygen free, I know that it's synonymous with the, with, with the um, uh, phrase anaerobic. And then I can then reason on the basis of, of uh, anaerobic, uh, something being anaerobic, even if I saw that the input was just oxygen free. But say I didn't have this, this relation in my knowledge base, but then received an input, uh, uh, information about a patient that had the, the term oxygen free. I wouldn't be able to reason about it. I wouldn't be able to make the link that says that this is, this, 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 uh, uh, this is anaerobic. And then all of the potential proofs that I could have come, come up with that led to some sort of classification that use the term anaerobic suddenly are, are not at my, at my disposal. And so having the capacity to, to deal with all of these lexical relations, basically trying to shoehorn natural language into a symbolic representation is extremely difficult. Uh, and, and it leads to, to, to uh, uh, basically, parser errors uh, uh, propagating into to, to, uh, uh, completely, uh, uh, rather parser errors lead to, to the system completely falling apart. And so, so the, 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 the expert system is generally not going to be able to be used uh, when it's uh, in deployment. So we have these two big problems. Did I hear something? No, okay, so how am I doing on time? Uh, I just spent way too long talking about the background. Okay, so what are we doing here? So here we're going to try to deal with these two big problems, the, the curation overhead and the brittleness of symbolic systems uh, by using language models. Uh, uh, specifically, we're going to use, an, we're going to create an expert system, but instead of having to write down all of the, 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 the rules about a given domain, we'll just have a language model dynamically generate inference rules, if then inference rules, on the basis of, of, of this, the knowledge that is stored in its, in its parameters. Uh, along some of the lines in order to handle the, the problem of, of brittleness, the problem of being able to uh, handle unseen natural language, uh, we'll use encoders. We'll use language model encoders, which are incredibly powerful and, and have the capacity to deal with ad hoc natural language utterances uh, because they can keep continuous representations as opposed to symbolic. Uh, and then we'll create proof stuff like that. Okay, so uh, how, what, what should this look like? Um, I'll start with a toy example, which I, I borrowed from uh, Peter Clark, uh, who is very influential in this space. Um, so here's a, a toy example of, of, of what's called a, a, a prologue uh, solving a, a, a query given a theory. So a theory is comprised of a set of facts and a set of production rules. Uh, and it's generally what contained in, in, the, in, in the knowledge base of the expert system. Uh, given a question such as conduct electricity nails, uh, the theorem prover will perform some sort of algorithm to try to, to, to prove that query. Uh, one of the most famous algorithms is backward chaining, uh, which means it's going to take the, this query, which is called a goal. Uh, it will search through its knowledge store for potential uh, items that can unify with this goal. Uh, unification means that they are, are predicates of the same uh, 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 arity and that wherever there is a, a literal uh, 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 Span the literal is is matched uh, between a given a query term and a given term in the knowledge base, or one is a variable so that they could potentially uh, unify under substitution. Um, I won't get too further into this, but uh, you can check this out in like any uh, textbook on artificial intelligence or on problem. Uh, but the general idea is it does basically a DFS through through the through the knowledge base in order to construct a proof that looks like this, uh, and so it will, just, will successfully figure out uh, that nails are are. Uh, conductive of electricity because they're made of metal, uh, because they are made of iron and iron is made of metal. Um, so in order to, to, to kind of incorporate the, the notion of a language model into this domain, um, Peter's lab uh, uh, at AI2 uh, introduced this notion of language models as soft reasoners over, over knowledge bases. So what they did was they converted the theory that was previously a set of symbolic rules and facts, and they turned them into natural language utterances, and then had the transformer attempt to reason in the same way uh, over these statements. And so it would create this, this natural language version of, of the proof. Um, in fact, this is a, a somewhat uh, different version of the proof um, because it does a forward 
uh, uh, chaining uh, as opposed to backward. So basically what it's doing is it, it, it's no longer trying to, to backward chain and unify the, the, the goal statement with, with uh, a potential next goal statement and next goal statement until it runs out of goal statements. Instead, it searches for a role that can, it can apply to a given query so that it, it can generate new facts that it knows to be true on the basis of, of, of what it has in its knowledge store. And so they basically just fed the theory to the transformer uh, and it generated out this proof and it was pretty good at it. Um, so this is me uh, feeding th this exact uh, span into a demo that that lab released, uh, and it was able to generate these these deductions on the basis of the theory, and it was able to prove that yes, nails conduct electricity. Uh, I'll note over here that natural turning something into natural language means that we can kind of uh, 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 treat facts and rules as somewhat interchangeable because now they're both just natural language statements. So what if we make things a little bit harder? What if, for example, we changed around this, this rule that something is metal or something else that it's made of is metal. And we said, if an object is made of some material, and then, then that object has the properties of whatever the material is. Well, if I feed this theory to the, to the proof writer, it suddenly falls apart. It generates a deduction that has nothing to do with the theory. Uh, and then it relies upon the, the deduction that has nothing to do with theory to still effectively prove the, the statement now is conductive electricity. So it's right for the wrong reasons. This is good. Well, this is bad because it's right for the wrong reasons, but it's good because we can see through this interpretable deductive reasoning chain uh, that it, it was wrong in how it operated. Yeah. Uh, each part actually goes to the encoder and the decoder. So there's a couple of different variants of, of the approach. Uh, you basically feed the entire theory as a, as a concatenated sequence into the encoder. Uh, and then either a seek to seek will generate this entire proof all at once, or it will generate a statement and then add that statement back into the context and then generate another statement. So it's, it's, it's uh, iteratively uh, feeding uh, um, sequences into a seek to seek model and then decoding one, adding uh, the fact back into the input and do that a bunch of times until it really ends up in an answer. Um, obviously that sort of approach doesn't scale. So, so, so sorry, just to be clear, the prompt here yeah. uh, is the query nails conduct electricity and it tries to generate proof that ends in that. Uh, so there's, again, there's a couple different variants. So actually this version of the prover doesn't actually take in the query. It only takes in the theory and it just tries to generate as many implications as it can about a given input. So okay. it's not actually seeing the goal hypothesis, which is one of the problems with this version of the work. Um, but there are future pieces of work that do a, a, a similar thing, but they actually, actually do take into account the query. Okay, thanks. Sorry, you said that. Oh, no, Any other questions, actually, while we're here? <laughs> okay, yeah. So, so one of the obvious problems with this sort of approach, uh, as we're sort of uh, getting at, is, is that this sort of uh, idea where you just like shoehorn all of the, the parts of the theory into the context of a transformer doesn't scale to larger amounts of, 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 of facts in a theory. So say, for example, we had this, we had uh, like say a hundred different facts, each of which is, is enough tokens that we can't fit all the facts into the, the context of the transformer at once. How would we possibly be able to prove nails conduct electricity? Well, we can't, the preferred is, is, is not able to do this when I feed it this version of the theory. So uh, one of the big questions here is how can we scale up to the size of the fact base given that we've created this version of a problem where we're asking a, a language model, C2C model uh, to, to perform theorem proving. So now we get to uh, uh, what we're doing here. <laughs> so this is Nelly, the Neural Symbolic Large Language Model Inference Engine. Uh, and so I, I sent the, the name of the system over to, to Patrick Shah, who's a former member of, of Lab, uh, and he had some Dolly credits lying around, so he fed it into Dolly, uh, and this is what it created. Uh, and so that's become the logo of, of the system. Uh, famously, Dolly is terrible at, at writing uh, uh, letters and titles, and so it actually created this, uh, but I thought I would cut off the bottom because that's kind of weird. <laughs> Um, so, so what is Nelly? It's basically a neural, it, it's a neural symbolic inference engine in that it has the skeleton of a symbolic reasoning process, but it's reasoning over natural language. And it's doing that through neural, neural networks. So the symbols that it will reason over are mostly natural language. There will be some domain specific symbols that we'll get into a, a little bit later. Um, and it's going to, to attempt to prove natural language statements given an externally provided expert verified store of 9,000 uh, natural language statements. So one of the appealing aspects of, of this, this type of approach is that it's going to be incredibly modular. It will disentangle the parts that are trying to generate inference rules from the parts that decide whether an inference rule is valid and whether a particular logical entailment is valid. 
In order to deal with the large knowledge store that doesn't all fit into a single transformer at once, we're going to use dense retrieval, which is in a, uh, basically a, a, a retrieval mechanism that computes in, uh, embeddings of a query and of a fact, and then it attempts to, to find the, the facts that are most similar to the query on the basis of embedding similarity. Uh, this is a kind of uh, uh, emulating what's called a, a weak unification approach, which is a, a softened version of unification where you no longer have to uh, uh, say that that two terms can uh, can unify only if they are are, are they do not uh, contradict on any symbol. Rather, uh, their similarity in symbols will dis dictate whether we can make a decision about the, the, the unification. Um, this soft version of unification leads to some, some implications with respect to search speed, uh, but uh, uh, for the purpose of, of this presentation, I'll talk about that at a different time. <laughs> um, and so, so how do we generate inference hops? We're gonna train a seek to seek follow-up with that. Um, and we're, we're the, the seek to seek model is going to have some, some interesting bells and whistles, uh, namely ways to incorporate the knowledge that's stored in the knowledge store into knowledge that's stored. Incorporate the sentences that are in the fact base and the structure of those sentences into the seek to seek generator in order to guide it towards inference hops that are more likely to be proved by the fact base. Um, and so the two approaches that we'll use are, are dense retrieval again and then guided generation, um, which is in, uh, giving some component of uh, that modifies the, the generation procedure either explicitly or uh, or uh, uh, somewhat implicitly uh, in order to to generate uh, utterances that otherwise we have. So we're no longer working in terms of symbolic rules that were curated by a, a knowledge engineer. Instead, we're going to define a set of meta rules. These meta rules will just specify the high level structure of the types of rules that Nelly is going to create. Um, I'll get into to each of these individually, um, but a unifying principle across all three of these gener generation rules uh, is that we're making external calls to neural modules using these things called neural predicates. Uh, so for example, you'll see that in this, this top, top right, uh, this fact unification module, which is effectively just trying to take a hypothesis and find a fact in the knowledge store that it tells the hypothesis. Um, and so the way it does that, you can read the, these, these uh, production rules left to right. That's the way that an, an, a, a prologue based uh, reasoning engine will work. Uh, so it takes in, uh, the hypothesis and it feeds that to a retrieve module. Uh, this little plus means that it accepts the symbol and this little minus means that it, it produces the symbol. Uh, so it accepts a given hypothesis to prove and then it will retrieve similar uh, potential support facts from the, from the knowledge space in order to, to potentially entail the hypothesis. And then for a given hypothesis in fact pair, uh, it will then uh, feed, feed the, the pair to an entailment module, which is an, another neural module that will classify whether or not the premise actually entails the hypothesis. Um, so that's the first uh, 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 inference rule, uh, very straightforward. The next two are basically variants of the same idea, which is if we can't unify the hypothesis against the knowledge base, then we're gonna try to decompose it into two statements that do unify this knowledge base. And we're gonna do that using a DRG or dynamic rule generator predicate. Uh, so that's what the CTC model, it's going to take in the hypothesis and then generate facts of F1 and F2, such that F1 and F2 will compositionally entail the hypothesis. Um, so if this is a little confusing, uh, don't worry, we're gonna go through an example. How am I doing on time? Okay, so here's a very high level uh, cartoon figure uh, showing a, a, a one potential uh, inference or search procedure that ends up proving uh, the statement, plants use chlorophyll to produce sugar. Uh, and we'll start at the bottom to, to kind of explain what's going on here. So the way that fact unification works, uh, so we, we take the hypothesis uh, statement, we fit it through a buy encoder. So it, a, a buy encoder is, is a, a BERT encoder or some version of a BERT-like encoder. So it's just a sentence encoder that creates, creates a, single, uh, a single embedding representation of a sentence. But it's been trained very cleverly so that the embedding of sentence one and the embedding of some other sentence two have been optimized according to some sort of distance metric. So specifically, we'll say that the embedding of, of hypothesis and the embedding of a fact, the cosine similarity of those two embeddings is optimized such that the, the model is, 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 is scoring, giving a high cosine similarity to, to facts and, and hypotheses if, if the fact is likely to be a support fact of the hypothesis. Uh, and it will give, give a low cosine similarity otherwise. Yeah. That, that sounds like an asymmetric uh, relationship and cosine similarity is symmetric. Yep. <laughs> yep, that, that's uh, that's fine. Um, I mean, is, is there a particular problem with that? Sorry? Is there a particular problem with that logistically? Uh, 
will. Uh, let's suppose A supports B, but B doesn't support A. Right. Uh, it seems like cosine similarity wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Great, great point. So this is why we have a second predicate in this production rule. So it, the retrieval mod module is going to produce a set of potential entailing candidates from, from the fact base. What we're, all we really want from, from this module is to, to be able to prove some, that some sort of fact that we know to be true entails the, the query hypothesis. So for any of the, the generated uh, the retrieved support facts, we only care about, or, yeah, yeah, look at those. <laughs> so so this, this is uh, what the, the dense retrieval mechanism uh, produces when you give it the query chlorophyll is used to for absorbing, absorb, absorbing light energy by plants. Uh, most of these facts do not entail the, the hypothesis and uh, the hypothesis may or may not entail some amount of these facts, but we don't care about that. So the second component of, of, of fact unification is to feed these potential candidate support facts through an entailment model. So an entailment model is classifying whether or not a given premise statement entails a hypothesis statement under some fuzzy notion of, of logical entailment. Um, and so we'll feed this list of, of potential support candidates to the entailment models and get back that one of these facts does in fact, does in fact uh, entail H. And so this, this, this problem of, of potential uh, uh, asymmetry is solved by uh, this, this external filter that is making sure that the, the directional, the direction, the entailment direction is held. Okay, yeah. so, so if I can just follow up. Yeah. yeah. So in principle, you could combine these into one model and trade it uh, just to get back facts that are actually entailing, through three facts that yeah. are entailing. But you didn't do that because somebody already found some clever way of creating S for phi, and so you wanted to use that. Um, but you had a symmetric model lying around, so filtering it. Was... So there are various ways. There are various reasons why I I, I, I allowed for this uh, kind of uh, conflation. Uh, one is that the retrieval model is going to be used for multiple purposes. Uh, so one is to try to find a support fact that entails a hypothesis. Another one is going to be retrieving a support fact that I will then condition the generator on to to generate a second fact. And so the generator is, 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 is producing pairs of support facts, as I'll get into. Um, but one of the kind of clever hacks here is that we retrieve the first of those two, th those two pairs. We have the model forced to code it and then generate the second one. Um, yeah. And so that is just a logistical decision because I didn't want to have two different store, uh, FICE stores. <laughs> um, yeah. Any questions about this? Yeah. Yeah, and so, so one of the, the, the uh, important parts of, of this type of module is that uh, methods that, there are a lot of methods nowadays that use uh, that some version of dense retrieval in order to retrieve important or informative examples in order to do uh, some amount of, of NLP-based reasoning. Uh, dense retrieval is really useful because it allows Nelly to scale to the size of the knowledge base. So we're no longer feeding the entire context into the, the transformer. We're relying upon dense retrieval as, as a way to, to do semi-parametric semi reasoning on the basis of an external knowledge. Okay, so here's the first two of the dynamic rule generation predicates. Uh, you'll see that it's taking in uh, this statement, chlorophyll, this intermediate goal, chlorophyll is used by plants to produce carbohydrates, and it generates a pair of premises. Chlorophyll causes plants to absorb light, and plants use light to produce carbohydrates, uh, such that the, the two premises in conjunction would prove the top level premise, so long as those two, pre those two new premises are then proved against the knowledge store, which we found that, that they, they will be. Um, so how, how does it generate this pair of facts? Uh, it feeds them to a T5 model, which is a seek to seek, a pre-trained seek to seek model fine tuned on whatever data set you want to find. Uh, in this case, I fine tuned it on, on uh, fact decomposition pairs. These uh, pairs H to F1, F2. So we take the, the generated outputs, we feed those through a different set of, of textual entailment filters, because again, F1 and F2 need to entail H. And then we get back a set of potential fact pairs that we'll attempt to recur on, uh, condition on the fact that they, the model believes that they will entail each. So one of the problems, if you look at these, these decompositions, they are potentially lexically very similar. There are many potential uh, lexical decompositions or, or semantic decompositions of the hypothesis that would entail it. Uh, so one of the major questions when working in natural language, which is infinitely expressive or extremely ex expressive, um, is that there are a lot of potential decompositions of, of, of the fact. And for every decomposition that we try to recursively prove, we're taking a lot more time in the proof search. Uh, so we want to be very clever with which of these potential decompositions we're actually going to try to recur on in order to, to prove the high level fact. And we want specifically to, to populate this, this, this search horizon with items that 
are more likely than not to be proved by the set of facts that are actually available to the system versus the facts that the system may believe through continuous parameters, but can't be verified to a human. So here's where I have to give a little bit of a detour to explain that the fact base that we're using for Nelly is not just a set of, 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 of support facts. So it's a set of support facts that were specifically designed. It's actually a really cool data set. I recommend people check it out. It's a, it's a, a, a semi-structured knowledge store such that the support facts can either be treated as natural language sentences or they can be treated as rows in these NRE tables. And these tables are organized by different types of inference supporting uh, uh, fact types. For example, there's a table that just gives a whole bunch of taxonomic relations between an item and, and its, its hypernym. Uh, there's another role, uh, there's another table called process role, which says that there's some sort of a process name, there's an actor, that actor has some sort of role in the process and the and, 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 and like. There's also a, a table called if then, there's also a table called part of, there, there's uh, 66 different tables. They're all really cool, highly recommend you check them out. So these inference supporting relation types uh, are were kind of uh, specifically designed to be able to, to be a part of an explanation of a given decision for science and science. Um, and so that's uh, 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 important, not just because it, it, uh, we have this organizing principle, but, but also because if a, if a type of, of fact is relevant to, to explanation and we're trying to generate structured explanation, then we should be aiming to generate items that, that reflect the syntax of, of these, these tables. And so, uh, we're going to try to bias our seek to seek rule generator towards the syntax of these facts. So how does that work? Half of the, the, comp the decompositions that our generator will generate are just freeform generations like you saw in the previous slide. The other half are conditioned on a syntactic template that reflects the syntax of one of these tables in the world tree. For example, yeah, there's the first tab and there's the second. Half. The T5 model might condition on the template blank is used for blank, which reflects the table used for, or it might condition on the template if blank then blank, which reflects the if then table. And so we have uh, 150 of these different templates. We feed each of those templates to the T5 model and it will it'll generate some number of, of, of outputs uh, uh, for each of those templates. And then we'll feed those potential outputs through the textual entailment model and then get a new set of, of candidates, ideally that is biased towards items that are, that are appearing in work too. Um, questions about that? Cool. We're running out of time. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, so the last version of rule generation is a lot more straightforward. Instead of trying to generate both of the two facts, We'll instead retrieve the first fact so it gets immediately grounded to the fact base and then we'll just generate the second. So you, you uh, get a set of potential support facts instead of hope, uh, hoping that one of these individual facts will by itself until the, the query hypothesis, we'll instead feed that as an F1 that will then become a part, uh, a part of a pair F1, F2 through uh, a, a forced decoding of the first fact using the same uh, T5 uh, uh, CTC model. And so we end up with, with a bunch of pairs of F1, F2, feed those to the textual entailment model and uh, end up with a new set of, of candidate hypotheses or candidate premises. But the first of all these candidate premise pairs has already been proved and so we don't need to recur on. So this, this is kind of really useful for a whole bunch of reasons. Uh, uh, one of which is that we have halved the, the size of the search horizon uh, effectively because we don't have to DFS recur on, on that, that new, uh, uh, fact. Yeah, so putting it all together, um, those are the three modules for the most part that are, 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 are dictating what we do in our reasoning procedure. Uh, we, to actually turn this into a, a, a system that can perform uh, question answering, which was the initial task uh, that we we're trying to solve, uh, we will take a, a, a science question answering fact, uh, uh, problem from, from a science exam, and we'll convert each of the choice, uh, potential choice answers into, into hypotheses as opposed to question answer pairs using a neural network model. Uh, and then we'll try to prove each of these potential answers using Nelly. Uh, and then uh, Nelly will assign scores to each, each of the proofs using uh, 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 effectively a monotonic aggregation of weak unification scores, which I didn't get into because I didn't have time. Um, but the, the general idea is that the score for a proof is, is an aggregation of Nelly's confidence that each of the individual facts that it retrieved from the knowledge store are actually entailing the intermediate parts of, of, the, of the proof tree. Um, we give Nelly a timeout of, of 90 seconds. We say that it can find up to eight proofs. And then we take the top score and proof for each of the options. And then the top score and proof, proof, proof of, of all the options is chosen as the answer. Uh, so results. So 
or evaluation. So, so we take two data sets of questions that were specifically crafted such that they are mostly provable using the facts in, in WorldTree. Uh, the first one is the WorldTree test set. So the way that WorldTree was crafted was you have a question and an answer pair, and then they annotated each question and answer pair with a set of support facts that have overlapping spans with the question and answer pair. But this explanation, while interpretable, is not actually a structured tree. Uh, and so this is, is not actually a, a, a gold explanation with respect to Nelly's goal, which is to create a binary explanation tree rooted in the hypothesis, or rather, uh, uh, whose vertex is the hypothesis and it is rooted in all world tree trees. Um, rather, this is just an unstructured graph with, with potential lexical overlap dictating the edges between those. Uh, then the other test set is the entailment bank test set. Um, which is a set, a set of question and answer pairs also from the, the AI2 reasoning challenge uh, as, as world tree is, is also pulled. Um, but these questions, we know that there, are, there is an explanation tree for a given question and answer pair uh, because those have been annotated with, with gold trees, which in fact we use to train our CTC model. Um, and those trees are mostly rooted in facts from world tree with the exception that some of the trees are rooted in, in facts that were written down by the expert annotators as, as being uh, externally relevant to the, the problem, uh, but aren't uh, actually pulled from, from the corpus itself. Um, so uh, this is all to hedge to say, uh, <laughs> we're running over two uh, test sets that are, should be provable using world, fact, uh, world tree facts. Um, but if Nelly finds a proof for a lot of these questions, uh, then we should be proud of her because it's not necessarily the case that there was a tree in the first place that was initiated by an expert. Um, yeah. So how do we do? So for both of the data sets, about 65 to 70% of the time, Nelly actually produces an answer. So it produces an answer if it produces a proof for at least one of the alternative options. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's for about 25% of the questions, it's just not finding proof for any of the options. Uh, Nelly, without any templates, uh, achieves somewhere around 40% accuracy on both world tree and, and, uh, and talent bank. With templates, it performs better on a talent bank, but worse on world tree. And so there's a variety of reasons for, for why this might be. Again, world tree is potentially more of a challenge set than a talent bank because a talent bank is a set of, of questions that definitely have tree based answers, whereas world tree has a set of answers that are just uh, arbitrary graph answers. Um, meanwhile, uh, Nelly with templates takes a lot longer to run <laughs> because doing template condition generation takes a couple seconds per call and you have to make many more calls than if you were just doing vanilla generation of candidates. So this kind of led to like the main thing that I've been working on for the last couple of weeks, which is trying to figure out the trade-off between the amount of think times you're making a generate call, which should potentially lead to better generated candidates using these world tree templates versus generating many candidates in a short amount of time and then attempting to recur on them uh, without kind of uh, any any intuition about whether those facts will be good versus bad. Yeah. Could you uh, speed it up by distilling the constraint model? Not particularly. So but by distilling, you just mean like reducing the size of the parameters? No, I mean, you train a new model. You generate a lot of synthetic data from uh, the constraint model and then train a new model, which uh, doesn't have to be constrained because it's sort of constraint. All right, so Ben asked me the same thing and I didn't understand when he asked me that. Okay, so, so, so. This is saying that you just, you just end up with a version of, of the for the template condition model that first predicts the template and then predicts the output. Not, not quite. It's just an unconstrained model. It's just trained on lots and lots and lots of stuff that looks like the templates. Okay. And so it tends to generate stuff that looks like that. Okay. And where did you get that stuff? Well, you generated it from the constraint. So the way that I create a template condition model is by uh, artificially noising the data similar to the way T5 pre-training works. So it can ideally, it, it can in theory accept any template regardless of whether they're from world tree or not. So I could, so I'm training it on some amount of facts that, that do reflect world tree syntax because they're either from Intelman Bank or because they happen to reflect that template. And I'm training on a whole bunch of data that doesn't. And I mean, I'm under the impression that both of that data, both, both uh, spheres of data are, are incredibly important. And having the capacity to then do template guided generation lets you leverage more noisy data that may or may, or may not reflect the syntax. Uh, um, um, while also having the capacity to generate only on, uh, condition on the syntax. If you were to filter the data for only items that reflect the templates, then you're losing that amount of information. Uh, okay, let's, let's that sure, yeah. Okay, so the moral of the story is that conditioning on templates leads Nelly towards a higher proof recall, which is good, but it, it or a higher proof precision, but a lower recall. So because it's more often to time out because it, it is taking a lot longer generating uh, uh, potential candidate utterances. But uh, kind of a, a promising uh, a result here uh, is that 
it, a lot less of the time it generates a proof of an incorrect fact that outranks a proof for a correct fact. So 20% of the time without templates, this is, this is happening. So it means it did find a proof for the correct answer, but the, the proof was, was outscored because it ended up with uh, generating a proof uh, that was grounded in world tree facts, but for some reason or another, uh, uh, through some reasoning error probably, uh, the, the incorrect fact was, was also proved and was not only also proved, but it was proved uh, 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 using a higher level of competence. Um, and so using templates seems to be good, uh, provided you can find the, the right trade-off again between number of queries and, and uh, 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 level of guidance. Um, yeah, uh, I don't have too much more time. So here's some example proofs. Uh, it has a, it does a good job. <laughs> uh, these are, are cherry picked, obviously. Uh, and so there's a bunch of example error cases. Um, uh, one of which uh, it, there are kind of certain classes of of of, of inference that it makes uh, with respect to compositional entailment that don't necessarily hold. So, for example, a lot of the decompositions are cases in which it basically performs a class based substitution from a hypernym to a hyponym or a hyponym to a hypernym, infers a property of the hypernym that doesn't necessarily always hold for the hyponym, and then uh, recurs on, on those two decompositions. For example, uh, planting trees is sometimes a human activity, true. Human activities have a negative impact on the ecosystem, usually true, but planting trees is not one of the cases of a human activity that has a negative result, uh, impact on the ecosystem. And so this entailment, uh, this, this uh, two-premise entailment doesn't actually hold for all cases. Um, yeah. And then, uh, yeah, so the, the, this second example is just really funny uh, <laughs> because this is, this is a, a case in which uh, some of the semantics of, of, of the, the high level query actually get lost when you uh, recur on individual hops. Um, yeah. Another problem. Um, so here, here's the high level query. The, high, the color of a dog's fur is inherited from his parents. Um, I always sneak a picture of my dog into, into my presentations. Uh, so that's a picture of my dog's mom. And then this picture of my dog, Penny. Uh, she's usually in room 319, uh, so you can come hang out with her whenever you want. <laughs> but anyways, so Nelly, when trying to prove this query, will retrieve a fact that is very useful in, in, in proving query, but doesn't fully entail it, and so it generates a second fact. The second fact that it generates is also true. Dogs are mammals that inherit inherited characteristics from their parents. However, when it tries to prove that statement, it ends up flipping over it, tripping over itself, trying to find uh, a potential decompositions all rooted in world tree fact base that will prove that that second statement. Sometimes, and, and so a lot of the, these inference hops are wrong for various reasons. But the big problem here is that the fact base doesn't came to contain the statement dogs are mammals. Um, and so just things, things fell apart. Uh, you'll notice, however, that the statement dogs are mammals is not actually relevant to the, the high level, the, the first entailment hop. If you remove the our mammals part and just said dogs inherit, inherit the characteristics from their parents, you'd be fine. Or you could say our animals and you'd also be fine uh, because that fact is in the fact base. So we have this problem where uh, regardless of how much guided generation we performed, uh, we still are, are potentially generating potential utterance, uh, decomposition utterances uh, that are true and are useful, but are not necessarily rooted in the fact base. So we have to do some amount more of, of, of iteration, figuring out whether, whether or not we should recur on a statement on the basis of whether it's relevant to the fact. Uh, yeah, so in conclusion, uh, we've created Nelly, who's this different engine, uh, who dynamically generates rules on the basis of the structure of the fact base. Fact base without us having to hand write tons and tons of, of high level inference procedures uh, in the, the, the kind of uh, uh, style of a classical uh, expert system. Uh, we do QA, find, finding the model does uh, relatively well for the, the uh, constraint scenario in which all potential answers have to be rooted fully in the, the fact of the fact base and have to be logically coherent. Um, and there's lots of space and interesting things to optimize uh, because the search procedure is somewhat flawed. The entailment filters and, and the individual modules need to be to be better. However, again, one of the appealing uh, version, uh, appealing uh, uh, features of, of this type of approach is that the the heavy modularity lets us in, uh, optimize each of these individual components uh, uh, in isolation. So we can work on the entailment filters individually. We can work on the generator individually and hope that everything then put together will be more effective. Um, yeah. Uh, I think I'll just skip through the slide. Yeah, so that's it. <laughs> yeah, so you could set like a minimum depth. Okay. I set a maximum depth of like four. And I say, if it finds a, a, a proof that depth D, then it doesn't recur to try to find a proof that depth D plus one, uh, because that like, 
in theory, should be worse. And for evaluation, so, uh, it's a simple detail to only get like you need a certain level of detail for it to be considered correct or just give it down. So this kind of gets into whether we can kind of reliably assume that that if we had gotten our entailment filter perfect, then these kinds of questions wouldn't be relevant, right? So if I gener if I if I uh, assumed a perfect entailment filter ended up with a proof of depth two, then I can say that I don't need to work any harder on making things detailed because I found the exact facts that entail my hypothesis. If I want if I like showed a whole bunch of depth one proofs to a human and they said, all right, the entailment filters aren't working in these particular cases, uh, then yes, you could theoretically uh, uh, impose that at least X number of facts have to be used in the proof. Um, but that's sort of like a, 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 a loosened version of a problem uh, that, that wouldn't be a problem had we optimized properly in the other modules. <laughs> yeah. So um, is there a finite number of proofs possible with world tree? Like, like mathematically because of it's a tree structure and obviously like if you choose different depths if you get way more like is there a maximum number of proofs that you could possibly generate from the world tree data set i mean you could do the combinatorics on nine thousand. Yeah, so like is this then essentially using a language model to try to select from that combination large set yep. of proofs now? yeah that's a great way of thinking about it in fact uh, the the Literature that talks about the brittleness of expert systems talks a lot about how a combinatorial explosion leads you to the, the case in which a question is very much provable, but purely because of the search one time, you end up with, with uh, a, a completely intractable search that just takes the curve. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think it's sort of a turtles all the way down kind of problem, right? So you could say, if I do black box C to C generation, then I don't have interpretability at any level beyond the input output pair. If I did black box generation the way I'm doing it here, say just to level of generate two facts that you use to, generate, to, 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 to make a decision, that's still technically black box, right? Because uh, we're relying upon the heuristics that were, that were in, uh, uh, learned through the basis of co-occurrence in the continuous language problem. Um, creating the level of granularity that I have here, which is depth N with all these extra filters that have specifically optimized to do the classification task as opposed to generation fact, uh, task, I would make the argument is a, a better version of, of, of granular decision making still using language models that are, are potentially relying on false heuristics, but simply because we, we've led, we've created a proof that has a whole bunch of these individual decisions in it, into these decisions, we could have a human go in and say, yes, this was right, yes, this was wrong. Each of those kind of decisions, uh, if rectified, would lead to a correct proof that is not only interpretable, but also uh, uh, was, was, was decided on the basis of multiple modules, some of which generated the other ends, but also some of which made the decision about what it was to correct. Yep. Yeah, so that, that's a great idea. Um, and it's something I thought about a lot, especially in the context of World Tree, right? So this. Here we are. Okay, so so then this this is as you like you pointed out, this is a structure resource, right? You can think of these as all as as, as predicate effects as opposed to not joint effects. So say for example, we tried to find the entailment tree, uh, the, the gold entailment tree relate uh, decompositions that are rooted in items that could appear in the statements. Then suddenly we have a symbolic inference rule as opposed to an language one. So something I've been thinking a lot about is trying to find the a way to induct the decomposition rules that are most frequent that can be converted into symbolic form. And then in, uh, imposing those as extra uh, attempt codes. The reason I haven't looked too like too much more at it is that the imposing this symbolic structure kind of uh, pulls away from the idea that a lot of what's going on here is relying upon the language models alone without doing it, having to do any extra or more than a required amount of hand writing. And so the, the narrative gets a little more fuzzy, but I agree that's interesting. Sure. So, 
one, sorry, there was also a second part of my question because we know that like we said first question had one way, one more call. Mm -hmm. It was like uh, uncertain because we know that in the world it's like uncertain everywhere. Mm -hmm. We don't know the rules in a sense. If you do this, you sit down. But it's just it's some kind of perfect. You were showing some counterexample when it doesn't work. And there was maybe something like you will it or some bad. And uh, this can cause some big problems in terms of concern because not everything holds. Yeah, so this is another interesting problem that I've been, I think about whether to like really like spend a couple of months trying to fix. Uh, this idea of like when is a generic fact useful versus when should it be not considered because there's some sort of contradictory case that we need to be reasoned about. Um, one of the avenues that, that I'm considering going down, there are other versions of, of restorative logic, uh, such as default logic, which is a version of, of kind of discretizing a notion of uncertainty where you can say that a given generic is true, provided that you don't have a counterexample in your knowledge. Um, how to do that in an efficient manner is again sort of up in the air, and so I, I I wonder also if there's a way to sort of inject into the the, the generator and, and uh, the, the filtering uh, type uh, framework uh, a way to say bad model you can't be doing this type of, of superclass inference uh, because that sort of pattern leads to these incorrect groups. Um, yeah. I have a bunch of uh, 